This one was an impromptu session that was put in place because one of the speakers dropped off. Uh, but I guarantee you it will be more exciting than the speaker that dropped off. Uh, there are a bunch of topics we listed because that's something that we, I've been hearing from a lot of people saying, you know, we need to talk about this. So I just listed no estimates, no project, no uh, backlog, and this is some of the stuff that uh, there's been a lot of noise uh, in this community and outside the community around what's happening. Uh, and what I want to do is over the next 45 minutes kind of spend maybe a good chunk of time first on the no estimates movement that's happening. We spend enough time discussing that as a group, and then we will move to other topics. All right? This is not going to be a presentation. Right? This is a fishbowl. Uh, how many people have attended a fishbowl before, a quick show of hand? All right. So the way a fishbowl works is basically we're going to create a circle over here and around one of the table. And then that would have, let's say, five chairs. At any given point in time, four chairs can be occupied. One chair is always empty. If a new person from the audience wants to come and present something, add in a viewpoint, they take that chair. One of the four people who were already sitting on the chair would leave and uh, keep that chair vacant for someone else to come in. So this allows all of us to participate in a constructive manner without it being very chaotic. right? And if that doesn't work really well, then I've got post-it notes as a way of uh, you know, making that noise a little bit less. And we will see how it goes. Right? Given we don't have too many people, I think this format should be good enough for now. How many people are familiar? Let's uh, kind of dive into the topic. Right? How many people here are familiar into the whole no estimate movement? What does that mean? Two people, three people, show your hands so I know. OK, not many people. Uh, should I kind of take a stab at defining what the idea is? How many people believe estimates are absolutely necessary for running software projects? Doing projects without this. Estimates is such an integral part of software development. How can you measure the velocity? Watch my video on agility. Uh, velocity is killing agility. Defining what no estimate or the, the, the idea behind the no estimate movement is, right? Uh, and I'll step a little bit back first even to explain why we came up with relative story, uh, relative sizing, basically, uh, story points or other kinds of things. But where we came from, let's take two minutes, do a quick kind of uh, recap of how things have evolved. Everyone's, I'm sure, familiar with effort estimation, estimating projects, estimating tasks in man hours, uh, women hours, whatever you prefer to call them, right? Uh, so back in the days, we would say these are the list of things that needs to be done. Each of these things are estimated in hours or days depending on some kind of an effort, but that was referred to as effort estimation. How long would it take for one person to finish this particular task or this particular feature, uh, whatever you're talking about, right? So let's say hours per person or per week or whatever. And what was the problem with this approach? Was there a problem with this approach, effort estimation? What was the problem? So let's make sure we are all having one conversation. So you are saying that when it was 50% done, it really didn't mean it was actually 50% done. I'm not sure if that was a problem, especially with effort estimation, but we'll, uh, we'll take that point. You had a point? It is estimate, right? So one conversation, or we'll switch to post-it notes. <laughs> So the estimate to what was the actual 
uh, what we were finding on where, what we were hoping is the gap between them would be relatively less and a bit more predictable because we are basing our plans on it, right? But if those numbers kind of are all over the place, it was just getting more and more difficult to, to use this as a measure. Effort is not same as duration. Does that make sense? All right, cool. It changes based on the person's skill. So this is very person dependent. Someone, for someone, this is a two hour task. For someone else, it could be an eight hour task depending on their skill set. So it's very person dependent, right? You had a point? Same point, all right. Awesome, so. So it expected more, you need clarity to be able to uh, be good at this, right? Uh, so these are few problems. We can spend the rest of the evening just talking about the problems, but that's not going to help us, right? Uh, so what did we do? How did we address this, these problems? We tried to address this problem by? Buffering. Buffering, yes, that was one technique. Looking at historical data. Pert uh, estimation, trying to give different estimations. And how did that work? Equally bad, <laughs> right? Then someone came up with a very smart idea uh, called story points. Right? Anyone knows who came up with the idea of story points? Mike Cohen, he gets way too much more credit than he deserves. That's recorded on the video. Uh, this was back in the extreme programming days. This is where story points come from. Uh, and the idea was as simple as this. Which of these two was longest, longer? The bottle? Everyone agrees? Any doubts in your mind? You're 100% sure? By how many centimeters? Now I'm forcing you to estimate or guess. But the first question, you were not guessing. You were pretty sure. right? So this was a basic premise of story points. And the idea was that human brains, the way that we have evolved, we are very good at relative sizing, but we are very bad at absolute measures. So this was an absolute measure, right? You're saying two hours, four hours, 10 days, 20 days, right? This is, this is something we humans are not capable yet. And probably the next 25 years, I don't see us getting better at this. So the idea was to move away from this and move to this notion of relative sizing. This is relative sizing. But how does this help us? I'm kind of taking all the way going back, talking about why this was bad, why story points was a good idea. Then I'm going to talk about why story points is a horrible idea. Then we're going to talk about you know, where do we move. And then we'll open up the fishbowl once we've laid the foundation. Right? So, how do we use story points? So we, uh, basically relative sizing, right? So we've got relative sizing. We look at two stories, two tasks, and we can say one is more complex, more uh, volatile, more ambiguous than the other one, right? But we still don't know how long it's going to take to do this because that's very dependent on the, who the person's going to work on, uh, you know, what's their prior knowledge, skill levels, and also, you know, the context of what you're trying to do. So we came up with this idea of from effort estimation, we move to relative size estimates. And a lot of people say, you know, you can take the relative size estimates. Uh, basically, what we did, actually, let me kind of recap, right? So we did relative sizing. We took a bunch of things, put them in different buckets, and we said this is one point, this is two points, this is five points, or three points, five points, eight points. We used a nonlinear scale 
right? We use Fibonacci series or something else, which is a nonlinear scale uh, to, to put these story points. Everyone's with me so far? And what was the rationale behind that? The uncertainty. Okay. All right, that's too complicated, even you don't remember what it is. So let's simplify it, right? To do, to, to, do, to D link. <laughs> Right? It's so hard, I can't even say. To de-link uh, the mapping, the direct mapping between effort and the actual points. Right. So when, when someone says something is one story point and something else is two story point, it does not mean that this is going to take 2x the time to do this. Correct? Everyone's on agreement with that? And then, how do we calculate velocity? We just said we are going to do this so that you can't apply arithmetics on it. And then we turned around and we said you add all the story points and that gives you the velocity. So my velocity this time is 15. Next time, I want to pick up 15 one-pointed stories. And guess what? going to be a disaster. So people were running into all kinds of challenges, right? One challenge was, even though we talk about relative sizing, in the head, developers, testers still keep thinking about effort. Right? It's very hard to get out of that because for years you've been slapped on your knuckles. And now when you say, hey, give me relative size, you're like, how many hours in my head? Oh, five hours, so two story points. And that was one of the big problems. The, what was the other problem with this? Problems with story points, guys. But the, the whole point was not to arrive at numbers. Right? And so your point is the management still wants a time-based scheduled. And so inevitably, we were forced to take these converted back to hours or days and show a dot on a timeline saying when this is going to hit that dot. And that was a problem, uh, not necessarily in my opinion with story points itself, but with the expectation of what you're going to derive out of this. But that's what you would account into the complexity, right? It's, it's, it's complexity is simple, but the number of times you need to do this or number of places you need to do this, this is bigger than this other thing. And we could do that. I think that there it has an advantage over effort estimation, in my opinion. Right? So it's not necessarily a problem. We want the graph to go up, 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 up. Sales go up, revenues go up, velocity go up, employee satisfaction go down. <laughs> so just to summarize this point quickly is uh, story points itself is OK, but story points with velocity led to this whole idea of it should keep increasing every sprint. You need to keep getting better every sprint. And when we started doing that, it was very easy for smart programmers to game this.
management wanted this to go up. I think that's the point you were trying to make. Yes, we all agree that it, it is, it's a tool for us to get better predictability, but it ended up being a tool, and I've been in companies where I've been asked, why is the velocity not going up? Was there ever an expectation of velocity going up? But you're doing things and you should get better at this, right? So shouldn't the velocity go up? Comparing teams, two teams' velocity, because one team is measuring in cookie points, another team is measuring in beer bottles. And people started comparing uh, how many cookie points versus how many beer bottles, and it didn't really make much sense. Right? So that was another problem. That's the second problem, comparing teams. But that was a hard problem, because if I put myself into the, the executive shoes, right? I want to know which of my teams need help. Not that I want to monitor them, but I need to know which of my teams need help, and what tools does Agile give me now to do that? And often the answer, the naive answer was, let's look at the velocity. If this team's velocity is not good, if this team's velocity is not going up, then these guys are bad, they need help. But that created another train wreck, so we'll not go there, but that's another problem. Uh, shall we kind of summarize quickly, because I think we all know 20 other problems that were there. But one problem no one's spoken so far, and I want to bring that, because to me that's the most important point, is story points and velocity focused way too much on output, and then focus on outcome. Does that make sense? I'll repeat myself. Story points, velocity, and other kinds of things focused way too much on output, not on outcome. What's the difference between output and outcome? Output is the number, the number of lines of code you wrote, the number of features you built, the number of tasks you completed, uh, yada, 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 right? Outcome is why were we doing this in the first place, and if we did this, did we actually achieve what we were trying to do? Our hypothesis was, for example, if we reduce the number of steps that it takes for someone to do a task, then the number of people doing the task more frequently will go up. Right, that's the outcome that we want. But we got so caught up in measuring these and be so happy that we are achieving our velocity sprint on sprint that we forgot even to measure the outcomes. Yes? That's all in theory, honestly. In fact, in fact, if you see someone's velocity pretty static, you know they're gaming the system. That's the first indication someone should look for. If your velocity is pretty st constant, it's being heavily gamed. Because velocity being constant is just in theory. In practice, I have not seen this in the last 12 years. That's what statisticians do, right? You tell me what data you like to see and how you like to see it, I'll show you that data. Uh, yeah. Uh, you're right, but I would strongly disagree with the second point that measuring value is very hard. 
I, I don't think measuring value is really hard because if you can't measure value, then you might well as shut your shop down and go. Because how do you know what you're doing is actually making any difference? You know, impact on product, and whatever it is that you're doing it for, but it takes a lot of time to do it. So people, like product owners, let's say, or big air quotes, will take that calculus into their head and say, oh, this is what I'm gonna get if I do it, okay? But you can't see that as you produce the software. In fact, it doesn't even happen at that point. It happened months or years yeah. down the road. So it's a very hard topic, okay, to deal with. I mean, I, will, I won't make an extreme statement. I, I, I think you're right. For some companies, it's, it's hard. It takes a while. Uh, but I don't think for all companies it's the case. Right? There, are, there are enough companies where they can find ways of measuring value in a much earlier way. Maybe not 100%, but some point of it. Because you need to validate whether you want to invest more on this, or this is good enough, or you should pull the plug. Right? I mean, to me, that's, that's an important point. So these were all kind of the challenges that were occurring. And what was the solution to this, or what was the kind of new uh, idea around this, is how do we tackle this? Uh, has anyone seen this Jeff Patton's uh, presentation on uh, flipping the iron triangle? Yes, no? Let me erase this off the board. Uh, no, this does not help. <laughs> Thank you. All right, awesome. Uh, everyone's familiar with the iron triangle? Yeah. Scope, cost, time. So I think traditionally with the first model that we defined, what we were trying to do is we were trying to fix the scope and estimate the time and the cost. They are a factor which builds on each other, but we were trying to estimate time so we can estimate the cost. And we would determine whether how to balance this triangle. right? And it turned out, for all the reasons we stated in the past, that this was a terrible idea. And then a bunch of people said, what happens if you invert this? That's an interesting idea. Time and cost is fixed. What does that mean? You have, you have a fixed set of people. You have fixed cost of running your business, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of your cost is fixed in some sense. You, you fix a time box which is two weeks, three weeks, five weeks, one week, whatever works for you, and you fix the time. Then you estimate what scope fits into that time box. Right? This is where story points and other kinds of techniques kind of came in, where you would go with the gut feeling the first time, you would look at how many story points you completed, next time you would do a projection based on that, and then you would say, okay, maybe we can take on so much. So you're estimating what scope you can achieve in a fixed time, right? And then people said, while this was a good improvement from here to here, we still have not really solved the problem for all the reasons we were stating. And then what's the no estimate movement now coming to the actual point, right? So I'll pause here. What I want to do is maybe get people to work in the groups a little bit so that everyone's voice can be heard. And you can think about what the no estimate was trying to do. Yes? No, no. So this is no estimation is not yet here. This is basically the story point approach. This was the effort estimation approach. This is the story point approach or relative sizing approach. 
the no estimate approach is a different approach. Sure. So this is one way of doing the no estimate approach. Okay. This is one way of doing. What I was trying to say is maybe we now, I've bored you guys enough. Maybe we do a smaller group kind of a discussion saying what a no estimate would be, right? We've seen the, we've seen the problems and what should be the next evolution. So I was kind of hoping you suggested one way of doing this. There are many ways of doing this, right? So can we do quick group discussions at tables? Yes? Let's uh, time box this for 10 minutes. I'm fixing the time box. Discuss in your group, what all livers do you have? We talked about these livers here. Are there more livers you can play around with? Right, that will actually help expand the context. Why don't you go join tables? Two minutes, so kind of try and wrap up your discussion and come up with a conclusion. People have woken up. Does any group have, I, as I was walking around, I saw still a lot of people defending why they need estimates. And that's brilliant. But it's not going to help you. <laughs> as Einstein said, doing the same thing over and over again faster is height of stupidity. Right? You need to look at there are certain problems, is there a different way? Whether you do it or not is a different question, but here we are trying to explore, is there an alternative, right? So if you're just defending why you need estimate, you'll never probably figure out, hey, there might be a better way to do this. And guess what, there are a bunch of companies out there doing it, so there's something to it, right? A bunch of companies, uh, uh, hundreds of companies, I don't know, <laughs> uh, lots of companies, <laughs> doing stuff out there without estimates. Sorry? No, he's asking me to give data on how many companies are doing this, and there's no way to know that data. Unless someone goes and does a PhD research on this, which will be published five years later, by that time no estimate would be irrelevant. Which table has actually a solution of a no estimate approach? Potential solution, I like that. Go for it. You need to be crisp, one minute, done. <laughs> awesome. How do you know that?
Working in Scrum? Yeah. Highly motivated, highly self-organized teams working in Scrum seems oxymoron to me. <laughs> Never seen it, sorry. A seeding approach, what does that mean? Yes, that is what I'm reflecting. Ideas. We have tens of different ideas, and which one to bring which one up to the group project should be here. Here, we are saying that okay, this is the project. We have to deliver it. So should I do a senior team or not? That's the question. We have to deliver it. There's no other option. We have to deliver what? That's the question. No, that is also wrong. And why is that the question? The customer oh, has ever been a problem statement and is expecting something to be delivered. Question is, do we know when and how and how much effort we can deliver? It? So you are saying that the scope is fixed and the timeline is also fixed. So I guess what you're saying is if, if I know exactly what needs to be delivered, right, mm -hmm. then I need to figure out how long it's going to take. No, I'm saying customer is asking you to solve some problem. He's expecting you to deliver something. But that delivery may not be where the point today. It will be rolling day basis, it will be fine. It's exactly. going to do it. But still, I have a fair idea that what we are trying to achieve. Now, what are the details about it? You do not know today. You should figure it out. But I still need to start from the starting point. I need to start. And I need to have fair idea that where how much time it will take, how much effort it will take. Right? I can do a reasonably okay job at this repeated point. I've done it in the past. I know the living rules attached. But still, yeah. even if those things are very done in the future, I can still do something for the immediate near future privilege. So as for the pause, I think what you're saying is you need an estimate. Yes, definitely. Yes. <laughs> okay. so, so let's pause on that because I I'm not I'm I I don't think we're going to be very constructive going into that debate. I'm saying let's look at is there an alternative way, and then maybe you can decide. You know what? This seems insane. These guys are stupid. I'm not going there. Or you can say you know what? This kind of makes sense. Let me try it out on the next project, right? And we will see. So what I'm looking for is ideas from tables where they have come up with a solution or maybe someone's actually experienced doing something of a complete no estimate approach, right? I know you, you've been raising your hands for a while, so we'll go there. Uh, we thought about, we talked about another lever, right? What is another lever? Good, great. Now someone's talking. So, so we thought one possible, okay, if you take a feature, there is a thing like how rich you can make the feature. Sophistication. How sophisticated you can make the feature. With a minimum acceptable grade, it may create a lot more of the value required. Right? So what we thought is, Try not to create the most sophisticated feature to start with. Right? Take all the feature set, try and create it to the minimum acceptable grade, right? and then go on building the bells and whistles on it, whatever that is. Right? Awesome. So, so you're saying if we added another liver over here, which is basically you took the scope and can we slice the scope into grades? Right, into grades or into levels of sophistication or whatever terminology you want to use. And maybe this is the bare necessity, bare minimum, bare minimum marketable feature. And that minimable marketable feature you put out there. And then you might decide you want to do more, scrap it, what do you want to do? So you're adding another liver, right? But go on, like what's the solution? This is good, but. What, what else? But you still need some estimate yet. This, 
And you know that, okay, if you've got 10 features, so if you've got, say, 10 features to be done, so you're going to create, a, say, a shipper bill agreement, right, with the minimum, whatever the grade that you want, right? So, uh, and then once you've done that, right, you continue to sort of add, add that. So, so then you want to advocate, then you want to advocate, this solution, Okay. okay, let's let's talk about this solution and it works when I've already got the project, when I already am executing the project and I want to incrementally deliver stuff. Yeah. But when I even need to get the project right at the beginning, right, and I want to see the feasibility, when I want to get the funds allocated either externally or internally, I need to have some projection of the effort it's going to take and the company might decide, you know what, this is not worth getting into at this point because it's going to take us two years to do it and it's going to cost us so much money, right? How do you tackle that question? What you're talking about is great. It, at the execution level, you can start slicing and you can start doing things, but a lot of people get stuck even in the first point, right? So I guess it's good to split them into two parts and tackle them separately. So, okay, so maybe I'll just add to this thoughts coming through. I think the problem is, you know, we, we try and define this thing called project. I think sometimes... So that's where the, the, the title was no projects so as well. <laughs> I, I remember that. And you know, we've, we've had a lot of discussions internally in our company. You know, can an agile project ever fail? Then we start talking, what is a project, right? So the problem may be that, you know, we don't worry about uh, trying to define a project that has maybe some checkbox, right? If you're continuously checking, See, look, is it worth going forward to the next step? I don't know, maybe something like that. Not fully developed, but some idea. We are running out of time. Uh, we have zero seconds left. You, you can give us the answer now. <laughs> oh, uh, there is no such thing. <laughs> but I have enough experience not having estimated for the last eight years and having delivered successful products in businesses, and I can quickly talk about some of the techniques we have used, these are not silver bullets, these are not gonna work in every context, but I can quickly jump through and summarize what we have tried to do. Uh, right now, I'm doing this at Hike Messenger. Uh, it's, a, it's a 100 million user company, uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty sizable. We have something uh, what we call as an opportunity log. These are all the kinds of things that the company could be building today to make millions of dollars or to make millions of people, impact on millions of people. Uh, we take three things which we think are the most viable ones and we run through a one week discovery on each of them. During this one week of discovery, which is a fixed cycle, we are figuring out what is the core hypothesis of this idea and how do we validate the core hypothesis of this idea. So all you get is one week. You don't get more than that. It's a fixed time box. You basically run in one week and you either have to come back with solid data that proves that this is something that the company should invest on, right? If you can't come back in a week, this goes back into the backlog. We might revisit it at some point. You pick the next most promising idea from here. Let's say you take this, you go through one week of discovery, there are a list of your riskiest assumptions, riskiest hypothesis, you run some experiments, you validate that, and you've got some data to, uh, you know, sometimes it takes, sometimes in a week, it's hard to get all of these data, but that's where a lot of hacking skills come in, right? What we do and what, how we collect data. Now let's assume some of this proves that this is actually going to increase our retention, this is going to increase, bring new user base, other kinds of things. Uh, so we have some high level uh, company wide OKRs or metrics that we look at which, which impacts the company. Could be things like retention of users, could be things like onboarding new users, could be increasing sentiment analysis uh, of, of the user, sentiment score of the users, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and what we do from there is basically if one of the projects satisfy, one of the ideas satisfy the need, we will take that and that would go into what we call as a dual track uh, development cycle, where on one track we are constantly doing discovery of what is the next most important thing that would add value. Let me just complete because we don't have time. 
hang on. <laughs> Let me just finish, please. Uh, we've taken a bunch of hypotheses. We've validated hypotheses. We believe that this is a thumbs up. We need to go with this. We run this through a discovery track. This is an ongoing track, no time box. So one other liver that we talked about is the time box. We remove the time box liver. And basically, we run discovery in parallel. We run delivery. Uh, at every discovery, we produce some kind of a validated result that goes into a delivery track, which constantly keeps adding stuff, pushing stuff out into production. right? And at any point in time, you can chop this off, saying this is not making sense, or pull this off. So there is this notion of moving from output-based measurement to flow-based measurement, where we are looking at how much value are we adding by constantly looking at flow. And splitting this into a discovery track and a delivery track helps us validate something before we start building it. Right? Validating the value before we start building it. Uh, th this is not going to do justice to the topic, but I know you had a question, and then we'll come over there. Hang on. It's a web sandbox. The company only has one week. We don't know. We don't know. We have no idea. We are saying one week is all we can afford. It's, a, it's what money can the company invest on an experiment. Mike? It's OK. Here's, my question is this. So you're basically saying you are choosing which work you will do based on the value it will provide instead of choosing which work you will do based on the estimate of how long it will take. Is that correct? That's correct. That's, that's one essence of it. But the other important thing is the, uh, you have to have actually validated that it will add value yes. before you start building Got it. it. And then it doesn't matter if it's going to take one week, two weeks, three right. weeks. But the other part to it is that I don't want to invest three weeks, but that's too long uh, for something to backfire. So we will try and slice it down. Sophistication livers with one idea. right? We want to slice it down to the least sophisticated thing that will actually help us validate that what was the hypothesis validated over here is actually coming back as real data. right? So instead of focusing on the time, we are really focusing on validated value yep. being added, and yep. both of them happening in parallel. So you're prioritizing based on what your ROI is going to be, essentially, right? Based on what you validated. And so then, so I'm trying to think about in a larger company how you apply this, right? Where you help leaders move away from feeling like they need to understand the investment it's going to take up front, instead being able to communicate validated hypothesized ROI and say, this is our biggest ROI at this point, so this is what our teams are going to chase after. And at any point, after you've applied those sophistication levers, if it feels like this isn't what we wanted to be, you just end it and pick up the next thing. Yep. Got it. It's uh, right now at, uh, at this company, we have 12 teams parallelly doing this. Uh, and this is basically happening in parallel at 12 teams level. Uh, so it's, it's not just one project. There are multiple, you know, teams working on this. All right. <laughs> Not feature. Hypothesis by hypothesis. One hypothesis at a level. A hypothesis can cut across 20 features. A hypothesis can be a dot on the screen. Release is happening every single day. Not to 100 million users, but to 100 users, 0.5% of the users, 1% of the users, 5% of the users, 20% of the users, and 100% of the users. When the value is actually validated in the market. So you had a hypothesis. You ran a bunch of experiments. You said, yes, this makes sense from the small database, uh, from the small hypothesis that you ran. You feel this makes sense. Then you're going to invest a small amount of time to quickly get that out. 
to 100 users, to 1,000 users, to whatever statistically significant number of users. And then you would decide whether you want to roll it to the next set of users or you want to pull it back. So you don't think you are just uh, going to one waterfall model uh, model of developing the I don't care. Why should I care if it's waterfall or not? It works for us. It's actually really helping us. It's saving us millions of dollars of wasted uh, effort building stuff that no one wants. Okay, Naresh, time out. Yep, time out. I'm out. I'll be here. I will be happy to answer all questions after this, but we have to open the door to get the keynote speaker in. So I'll be around. Thank you, guys.